good evening. My name is Corrine Jackson. I'm the Communications Director for the Okanagan Basin Water Board and manage its public outreach program, Okanagan WaterWise. We want to make sure that uh, you will be able to hear our panelists this evening. So I'd ask you, please, if you haven't already done so, please put your audio on mute to ensure better quality sound for everybody. Again, thank you for joining us this evening and happy Canada Water Week. Before we get started, I wanted to give thanks and acknowledge that we are broadcasting this event from the traditional and unceded territories of the Silk Okanagan Nation. Also, thank you and welcome to our event partner, the UBC Okanagan Institute for Biodiversity, Resilience and Ecosystem, Ecosystem Services, BRAISE. While Lost Rivers does a brilliant job of showcasing how creeks and rivers have been buried in cities all over the world and the problems that this has caused and efforts to restore these areas. The Okanagan is not so different. We have done the same right here in this valley and have much to learn and much to do to try and fix our past decisions. I recall stopping at a grocery store a couple of years ago near the water board's office, the Save On Foods in Mission Park Shopping Center. I was on my way home after work one day and stopped to grab some groceries. And if any of you have ever been there, you know how crazy busy that little parking lot is. And on the other side of the street is a sweet little creek that Daryl will be talking to you about, Fasho Creek. And in the parking lot was a mama duck with some of her ducklings in tow. And I was so excited to see this wildlife. I'm always excited whenever I see wildlife. Um, but my delight quickly turned to concern when I recognized that of course this poor mama was gonna try to navigate this parking lot with her babies and likely try to cross four lanes on Lakeshore Drive to find the creek and my heart sank. And as the song goes, we had paved paradise to put up a parking lot. Well, tonight we're going to celebrate um, just some of the efforts being made to fix, to fix some of, the, some of our past wrongs. We've gathered a very small sampling of some of those involved in bringing awareness to these special and important waterways of the Okanagan and those involved in rehabilitating and rewilding these areas understanding their importance in ensuring a healthy community for all that live here, the plants and the animals, human and otherwise. I'm gonna introduce our panelists and each will speak for five minutes about the projects that they're involved with and then we'll go to a Q&A. At the bottom of your screen, you should see that there is a Q&A tab. Ah, thank you very much, okay. Um, so there's a there's a Q and A top tab at the bottom, and we welcome you to put your questions into that box. So please note who the question is for, and we will then provide the questions to the panelists once all the presentations are completed. So our Q and A guests are Anna Warwick Sears. She's the Okanagan Basin Water Board's Executive Director, and uh, Anna will be providing an, an overall context to the importance of these projects in addressing flood concerns habitat conservation, and more. Daryl Arsenault is a fisheries biologist at Arsenault Environmental Consulting. He was the project manager for Kelowna's Fascial Creek Daylighting Project at Kalo Middle School, and has been working on creek rehabilitation projects in the Okanagan for over 23 years, and is a longstanding director of the BC Lake Stewardship Society. Carrie Alex is fisheries biologist and fluvial geomorphologist with Okanagan Nation Alliance, involved in several water-related rehabilitation projects, including the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative, which she will be focusing on this evening. And Alexandra Dulek is director of the Center for, Creative, for Culture and Technology at UBC Okanagan an associate professor in the Faculty of Creative and Critical Studies and principal investigator with UBCO's Okanagan Waterways Project. She's also involved with the multimedia project uh, with Okanagan Waterways, um, which draws attention to the waterways of the valley and is a member of BRAISE. Anna, we're going to begin with you. And uh, since you're the one who suggested this film, 
Um, and I'm just going to talk to James on the back end. And James, I think um, you can just stick here for a moment. Um, and actually, we're going to we're going to go to Anna, um, who suggested this film. So Anna, could you tell us why you picked this film for Canada Water Week this year, and what it was that you connected with, and in terms of uh, your work in the Okanagan? Thank you, Kareem. You know, um, the image that strikes me the most from this film and the one that I carried away with me, because I saw this film quite a number of years ago, I think it came out in 2012, that the image that sticks in my mind is that network of braided stream channels going through Toronto and that image of, of the braided stream channels being completely encased in these <laughs> drain pipes. So what we think of as um, just a storm drain system is actually the map of the stream channels. And for some reason that really stuck with me. And this year we've been working a lot uh, with different communities in the Okanagan and connecting with different communities across BC about uh, what's variously called natural assets or ecosystem services or green infrastructure, which is a way of looking at the value of the natural systems and how they can replace some of the really expensive and difficult and environmentally problematic uh, concrete and pipe systems. So it's, um, it's considered to be Still pretty new, new concept, new technology, um, which shows again how far ahead of its time this film was. Um, some people talk about uh, the daylighting streams as the reinvention of the ditch, but um, there's a lot more to it than that. What we're trying to do is we're trying to anticipate the fact that climate change is bringing these more intense storms and that the way that we've been engineering these drainage systems, they're not big enough to accommodate those peak flows. And we have to think differently about how, you know, this green infrastructure uh, can, like they showed in the film, have the water infiltrate into the ground, uh, pool, on top of the ground, um, uh, green people are talking about putting green roofs to catch the rainwater and slowly releasing it rather than having a big flush. Just a million different small solutions using natural systems or natural like systems that will help us manage this large amount of water um, that we anticipate, which, which our, our engineered systems are not always able to do, or I should say, because we can have green engineered systems, we, our traditional pipe and concrete engineered systems may not be able to accommodate at all. So I'll leave it there. And I'm really glad to have been able to share this film with you. So looking forward to the discussion. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Daryl Arsenault here. I am lucky enough to be invited to make a talk about some daylighting of stream projects that I've been involved in in the Okanagan. And as we know, and from that great film we saw, uh, we're seeing that there's many different reasons why streams have been put underground. Um, in here in the Okanagan, I think mostly it's been from, you could start with agriculture, and then you go to transportation, and then you go to industry, and then you go to housing, and now we go to flood control. Now, flood control is often a reason why, if you look at Penticton Creek, for example, where it's put into a concrete room, you know, all know what the name of flood control, and Okanagan River, which Carrie will be talking about as well later. So, but they, here they seem to have changed gradually over time and get filled in. So agriculture pushes the banks closer, pushes the creek to the edge of the property, and to, to the, the ditches, um, what you need to do is actually open the creeks up and return the floodplain. 
So in order to do that, we have to do uh, things like this one here, which is a very interesting project. But I have to really uh, key my memory for this because it was back from 1999 when I first moved here. And it was a, a place called Canada Lands and uh, by CN Rail owned the property. And it's when they used to have uh, historical boats where everything came by either boat or rail. So as the rail system came through downtown Corona, it went to the dock where you'd have the big boats taking the material. And so that was a big, huge area by Sunset in Ellis where it was all, the creek, Brands Creek was put underground. And of course, creeks that are put underground are often creeks that we consider not having much value depending on the time. And the time at this time was, they didn't have value because they don't have uh, trout. They don't have things that we catch and that we consume. Uh, and it's just, we're learning that over a long period of time now really, that that's just the wrong way to think. We need to think about it, that the natural assets, the ecological values. So in this case, they took a creek that you could not see when you look at that, that top video, top photo in the left corner, and they opened it up. And they only put about a five or 10 meter buffer on it, but it was really as part of a, a plan to develop those lands. So you can see in the bottom right corner what's happened over time. It's amazing how the grand, and all those developments on Sunset and the mill at the north part, which is likely also going to be the next step of development in that zone, where it's become a very, very valuable feature where people walk and they enjoy it and you see the fish come up there. When we went and we uh, took the fish out of that system to salvage it in order to do this, because it was encased in a creosote culvert, can you believe it or not? Like, like the amount of stuff that went down that system would have just terrible and they created a sediment pond in the bottom left corner there uh, or the, sorry, the left side of the photo we caught thousands of fish so nobody said it said there's no fish in there but again there were thousands of fish next slide i uh, will show you another project that i worked on um, recently i was really lucky to be part of and that was a Spatio creek restoration at the klo middle school um called klo i don't know how to say it in french i'm sorry even though i have the french last name i had uh, not had the pleasure of learning the language well enough. But that uh, was a box culvert, a culvert, like a half a 900, covered with um, concrete slabs. And it was put there because they didn't want the kids going into the creek and it was messy and smelly. And so it made it easy to have a school, a playground, and a creek that was covered. But the kids, as you might know the history, found turtles in their long jump pit and those turtles needed to be saved. So the kids pushed for it and there was a project that happened over uh, two years uh, and it happened with as the funding came along. So as you can see the, the bottom part of that nice drone shot supplied by one of the contractors showed a nice little pool um, opening up the floodplain as much as possible but again within the constraints of the system. So uh, it, it would have been nice to create uh, a wider floodplain, but you've got to always work with what you have. So in this case, you can see a, a line going around the outside, uh, like a ditch, you see that? Well, that ditch is where the water had to be piped in order to do this work in the dry. And so often that's a very big challenge, uh, but we were able to do that. We got pipes donated by people from the Ministry of Works, Glen Row, and we it, uh, worked out very well with still both pieces and a lot of people donating time to get this done. And I know I'm speaking quickly to get through my five minutes. because There's so many other projects I could tell you are they're so interesting. But these, these two are, are ones that were actual daylighting projects within the city of Kona. And of course, there's more work being done on Mill Creek and there's more work being done on, on South Okanagan on Frederick Creek. But this one shows us um, you know, an example of what happened when it was done um, just after it was done. And you can see there's a really important is to get lots incorporate a floodplain, reintroduce large woody debris, put plants within that floodplain, and it does better because the plants are closer to the water table. Don't just open a creek up and expect it's all gonna work well. You have to get the plants down by the water and, it can, and then and control, control invasive weeds. Of course, the Siberian elms here, are terrible, so hard to control. I have to go back in there with my shears when I go for walks, and I'm sure other people do the same thing. And of course, there are so many other, and in the next slide, we'll show you what happened 
over the next few years. And it's been an amazing project. Uh, many people involved, OBWB was a funder, um, friends of, of many different banking systems and the BC Wildlife Federation. So um, there were those willows were from my own backyard that some of them planted and we can uh, put some nice side channels in there and some undercut banks and it's really become a great, you know, great, great service for the community. Many more to Thank come. You. Thank you so much, Daryl. Really appreciate that. We're going to move to Kerry now with the Okanagan Nation Alliance. Thanks, Daryl. Hello, good evening, everybody. Um, I am here to talk about the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative, although it's not a daylighting project. Um, channelizing rivers is also very detrimental to their function and their ability to have um, healthy ecosystems and fish returning to them. So the Okanagan River Restoration Initiative started in uh, 1998, so it's been around for 22 years. I'm the chair of that steering committee. And in that time, um, we've done about 10 different projects. Uh, the first one took about 10 years to do, but we've been much quicker ever since. So um, they're, they're, they're moving quite well. Uh, the river, the Okanagan River uh, that you're looking at in that slide. So it was channelized in the 1950s. 84% of it was channelized. So there's a three kilometer section of the river that flows through the Soyuz Indian Band that was left in its natural state. 50% um, of its length was lost. So for a fish, this is like losing half of your house. 90% uh, of the riparian vegetation was lost. Um, the in-stream diversity was lost, pools and riffles, beander bends, log jams, all those bits and pieces that fish need. Um, so they basically have lost their kitchen, their living room, their bedroom, everything. Um, so it's just like shoving a, a lot of fish into, or a few fish into a foyer. Uh, so it's not, um, incredibly fabulous for Indigenous fish uh, for habitat. It's also lost uh, its connection to floodplain uh, and its ability to kind of maintain some of its wetlands as well. And all of these things have huge ecosystem benefits in terms of providing um, uh, places for all the different plants and the cottonwood that we are really uh, losing in a fast rate here, as well as uh, amphibians that are so many of the amphibians in the riparian areas that so many of the species are, uh, are getting listed as species at risk. Um, so we've also had sort of quite a bit of native fish uh, decline. So sockeye, chinook, steelhead come up from the Columbia and they spawn in the Okanagan River. A lot um, less of them now than there used to be because of the channelization. Uh, and then resident rainbow trout and uh, kokanee are also still in the area. Uh, can I go to the next slide? Thank you. So some of the projects, some of these 10 projects that we've been working on, um, you see here a dike setback project. We took the dike and we moved it back. We reconnected some of the old oxbows, reconnected meanders. Within this section, we also built pools and riffles um, and spawning beds for uh, fish. Uh, we did it in such a way that the energy is sort of conducive to it maintaining itself. So it's, they're not, it's not hard engineered. It's sort of re-engineered to let the river flow um, and move its own stuff as it needs to. Um, we've also connected side channels, uh, had projects connecting side channels, projects connect reconnecting floodplain habitat, projects that um, related to the river restoration initiative that uh, assisted with um, wetland development in some of these floodplain reconnections and um, building sort of cottonwood meadows um, that are also reconnected um, to the rivers in, in high flows. One of our next projects that we're kind of excited about is working towards, oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> so that is sort of it as it sort of migrated over time between uh, when it was first put in, the dike setback was in 2008, the re were in 2009, and some of those photos sort of, of, of are us watching it slowly um, grow back in and re-naturalize and create its own gravel bars and move its own stuff around. Uh, next slide. So some of the next projects we're excited about is in o Okanagan Falls, where we're looking at renaturalizing the river there um, and backwatering some of the uh, drop structures that exist as weirs um, to create these pools and riffles and create more natural habitats where we can squeeze them out. Um, and I think that the core of what the guidance that I've been given between the elders that um, I'm very privileged to be able to meet with regularly and the Okanagan Nation Alliance um, is that it really is this, the respect for water and the connection to water that seems to have gone a bit awry. 
Um, flowing water, it has a rate of change and it has a natural rate of change. It's actually quite slow. When we channelize rivers, we either try and stop that rate of change, but we end up making these explosive rates of change, big, um, big uh, ch chances for bank instability and areas where erosion kind of happens. So we actually create our own problems and we create rivers that are really hard to maintain and quite expensive. It's not cheap to run dikes um, and to kind of be dredging rivers uh, and dredging mouths just to keep them um, keep them flowing. Um, a free flowing river is actually is the cheapest form of rivers that you can have. Uh, and I, it really is to combat the errors of the past. Um, the silk people uh, have had such a strong respect for water and, and to share water with other species like the cottonwoods and the salmon. So many elders talk about water as the first medicine. Uh, and that we need to give it a lot more space than we do. And we need to give it a lot more respect um, uh, than we do in today's society. Um, because so many still did live by rivers in very large numbers and had a very healthy relationship. And I think that relationship stemmed from that um, core sense of respect uh, for, for rivers. So this very last slide just shows the, uh, the river as it once was um, prior to channelization and the section that has been renaturalized. And that is all I have to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. I keep forgetting about the mute button. Um, Alex, you're next. And James will advance your slides for you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to share with you today uh, the Waterways Project. Um, it is an exhibition we're preparing for Kelowna Museums. Uh, and it's uh, a collective effort uh, that we're working with many partners, including ONA and OBWB. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the university team includes Dr. Jeanette Armstrong, Dr. John Wagner, and um, Dr. Lael Parrott, um, each uh, a uh, person brings an uh, incredible amount of knowledge from their own perspective. And one of the key idea regarding our exhibition is to try to understand waterways in the Okanagan from indigenous and non-indigenous cross-cultural perspective. And as Carrie has mentioned, uh, uh, one of the core element is to explain the differences in worldview and the notion of water as healer and as life-giving um, as opposed to water as a resource. And uh, in that context, we're following, uh, we're looking at past, present, and future. And the slides you're seeing currently uh, were based on the aerial pictures from uh, 1930s, uh, where one can see what the Okanagan looked like. Um, the waterways in Kelowna is specifically, we're looking at Kelowna here, looked like before uh, the development. And we're building the virtual environment, uh, restoring uh, the land uh, as it used to be, um, overlaying it with the present day Kelowna and uh, hoping to be able to look at the past and present in order to see the future. Now, coming to a future, it's a really in interesting question. Well, what is the futures of the waterways in the Okanagan? And um, for our exhibition, we focused to follow uh, two uh, particularly successful restoration projects. One is the return of the salmon, that uh, project led by Okanagan Nation Alliance, um, uh, a 20 year project that resulted in uh, um, salmon returning, as well as uh, the eco community place, which is um, focuses on restoration of cottonwoods and yellow breasted chat and provides the concept of the open outdoor university uh, or the school from which we can learn about local environment. Uh, now, why do we wanna visualize uh, Okanagan as it was before? 
uh, it's a great opportunity for learning. Our exhibition is focused on um, cross-generational audiences from children to uh, grandparents and to policymakers. <laughs> and um, by understanding what it was and the values of each uh, living being in the Okanagan that is supported by the wetlands and the waterways. Uh, we may uh, also be able to uh, build shared values and shared worldviews so that we can work together and collaborate uh, specifically to pro protect our environment. And these last few slides uh, are showing the, our uh, exhibition design. Uh, it's a media exhibition and we conducted an extensive number of interviews um, uh, from the knowledge keepers, ONA scientists, uh, fisheries, as well as uh, uh, other important uh, actors in the community and we will be showcasing their perspectives on the projects and the success, successful collaborations. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Alex. Appreciate that. Okay, so we're gonna move to the question and answer section of the evening. And um, so we've got a few questions. Um, we'll start with uh, Glenn Sinclair had, had one. And he didn't say who this was for. So I'll read the question out. And um, 40 years ago, while working with the Salmonid Enhancement Program, fisheries officials showed me a map of all the historic streams in Greater Vancouver that were now converted into underground sewer and stormwater mains. My question, in recent years, has anything been done to correct and or restore some portions of any of those waterways? And um, I don't know if anyone can speak to Vancouver, um, but yep, go ahead, Daryl. Hey, I can only share a little bit because I've been involved with stream keepers for a number of years. I we became a stream keeper um, trainer back in the late 90s here and learned about the lost streams of, of, the, Okina of the lower mainland. I even have a book on it that shows all the maps of the lost streams of, of the lower mainland. And it's amazing how many have been done, but stream keepers have actively been working on bringing those back. So each individual group. So there's been a few, like uh, certainly um, on the, what's that? there's a, a bay downtown there that they've been opening up the creeks. So every, every community is really working on a few pieces at a time. And that one, Glenn, that's a great question, but they are doing that piece by piece. Thank you, Daryl. I can answer that second question too, if you want. Absolutely, go for it. Do you want me um, to read Glenn, it out? You also asked about stormwater um, and, and using these infiltration basins. And I can think of a few, for example, in Upper Glen Rosa on the west side um, and other places where you might think they're just little toboggan hills with a little bowl uh, with the playground. But uh, yeah, they've been designed to, uh, to take storm flows and to what they use is an overflow system. So on their normal storm drainage as they're going down the road, they'll have an overflow. So if it gets too too high for the pipe to handle or a certain height, it spills into these infiltration basins. So yes, it's being done. I think it's being done more now because we understand the, how you can save money and not have to upgrade your pipes. Thank you, Daryl. The next question um, came in and it's for you, Daryl, but I think that um, certainly Carrie can also respond to this one. Um, maybe we'll start with Carrie if that's okay. And um, it is from Tracy Davis asking if any creeks are being restored to their natural meanderings. Carrie, is that something you can speak to? Yeah, we've, um, we've done a few uh, restoration projects where we've been able to restore creeks to their natural uh, meander pattern. It has huge long-term um, long benefits to, uh, to, to add that pattern back in. It's the, it's the shape that the water wants 
um, creeks want to meander. So the minute you channelize them and you put your house next to them, you typically have to protect your house somehow with a dike or riprap. And what seems sort of unfortunate is that these people who are probably in the love of their hearts want to just love, just look at these creeks are actually just watching them die slowly because it stops this rate of change that is really quite natural and normal for a creek. When it is able to meander, it can create pools and riffles. It can maintain those better. And those are the areas where fish need to find food, where it collects certain kinds of spawning gravels. It's it, just having water doesn't necessarily mean it's a good place for a fish to be. It needs this these diversity of these places. And having you can have dikes, just set them back so that you can um, still let the river do what it needs to do. Otherwise, instead of having this gentle rate of change, or they just slightly move a little bit within their meander bend, you end up with these very explosive rates of change. And we've created a, basically a problem for ourselves that ends up being very costly in maintenance of it. So the more we can do projects like Daryl is suggesting or these river restoration projects, they actually have very, very long-term cost-effective for the, for the community on a whole cost-effective benefits. Just to, we need to set back and we need to let these rivers kind of run a little bit more naturally. Okay. Daryl, can you um, provide a few examples in the Valley where this kind of work is being done? Um, I, I can add to that a little bit. Uh, Terry, you, you covered it so well. Really, what's uh, Mill Creek, for example, is being, being done quite a bit, uh, but it's really little pieces. I'm working on one project in Ellis, um, down by the where the, we're opening the creek channel up quite a bit and increasing meandering, but it's only a 30 meter section, so pieces at a time. Uh, of course, Mission Creek, with opening up the floodplain and moving the dike set back, just like you are in Okanagan River, is also another one that's happening as the funding comes together for that. Todd Cashin was working on that in the, the, the Ben Bulin area. Um, and then I've, I've worked on a few in the South Okanagan as well, but it's really for large landowners that have the funds to do that, that are interested in naturalization. Uh, Frederick Creek and Coosie Creek are a couple other examples. Thank you. I was going to mention that um, the Okanagan Similkameen Stewardship Society is a group that we work quite a bit with, and they also um, are involved with um, landowners and helping them with um, habitat restoration on their own properties as well. They do work up and down the valley north to south. Um, Alex, Dorothea Atwater is wondering when your exhibit will be uh, will be open. Can you give us a bit more uh, information? It's going to open in September uh, 18th um, this year, and it will run until February. Thank you. Do you want to just give us a little um, teaser as to what we can expect to see? Uh, well, we have a really wonderful sets of interviews that we've been collecting right through the COVID, some of them are on Zoom, but uh, some of them uh, we were lucky to do in person. So we are essentially having three different sections. Um, and one section is focusing specifically on the return of the salmon project. The other section, as I mentioned, is focused on eco community place. Um, and the third section is a uh, is the, based on the interviews that Dr. Marla Sam uh, collected um, from the Columbia um, Colville tribe, and it, it look it, it's just, they're actually really important because they bring the sense that we're living in a much that the water connects everything, and that we are connected through the Columbia system, um, it managing. Uh, so that those sets of interviews are specifically focused on the water as the healer connector and the values that it brings and deep respect and most importantly responsibility we have towards water 
um, and towards protecting by protecting water, protecting um, all the living beings. So uh, that's one section. And on the other side, we're doing the pre contact visualizations of uh, the Okanagan as a way of um, really learning about uh, the different species, the environment, and what is it supposed to look like. As you, I included the pictures from Kelowna, the rate of change is, has been very dramatic. So understanding uh, that through visual uh, engagement. Um, thank you, Gary. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Um, Anna, I don't know if this is something that you can speak to. Um, it, we have a question, what's in store for the next phase of the Mission Creek Restoration Initiative? I'm not too sure if you can really speak to that. Um, I'll let you if, you if you can, but maybe if you can speak to some of the benefits of that project that some people might be unaware of um, that we've seen in the Valley. Yeah, I, I can't really speak to the next phases because I'm not in the planning part right. of that. It's a, right. um, the, um, the things that I have seen is by, it's a lot like what uh, Carrie talked about and what Daryl talked about, you setting back the dikes, allowing the Mission Creek to find its own course. What it does then is it, it really um, re, uh, re creates the um, habitat for all the, the fish and the birds that are want to live there. So by sorting out the gravels, by, by the river moving, it sorts the gravels out into um, habitat for different types of organisms to prefer. It's fish like certain types of gravel for spawning, insects like particular types of gravel for hanging out in. And the river is creating that habitat by moving back and forth. It's also um, the, a lot of people don't know that the cottonwoods really depend on flooding in order to regenerate. So you can have these massive stands of cottonwood by the side of a stream like you have on Mission Creek, but they won't be babies unless the area around them is allowed to flood. And that is what causes the cottonwood seeds to germinate. So uh, that, that activity of giving the river, giving the creek more space is what's regenerating all the life around Mission Creek. an interesting one to share with you guys where we did the same thing last year and Carrie worked with me on this project on Middle Vernon Creek at the old Aspen Grove golf course and we, we took I was able to convince the school district to take all of fairway number four and turn it into the riparian area so we a 25 meter buffer where they had constantly been cutting down the cottonwoods. I mean, that's about a two meter buffer of cottonwoods between the golf course, or else you're always losing balls into there. And what happened was we took all the trees that they took from the golf course and they would have chipped them up and taken the landfill. We, we spread them out haphazard through this 25 meter zone. And I was just back there last week and it's amazing. The cottonwoods are just shooting over into this zone and they're coming up all around. And we, put piles of sand for turtle nesting. And um, right now we're realizing it's not just uh, wildlife that we can appreciate, it's the people, right? We always have to allow that we are part of the ecosystem. And I wanted to say that that's, that's added a nice big flood zone and riparian zone that's can restore on its own, but it's also going to be used by people. And we just need to plan for that accordingly. So that was also a, a gabion basket wall removal that Carrie helped with and we put in a nice a spawning ripple there. And that fall, we had so many kokanee come and, and populate that area, probably 10 times as many that were there any other year I looked at. It was just a, it's a, one of those really good, feel good projects that uh, is gonna be finishing up this coming spring. They're gonna be actually expanding the flood capacity on the other side of the creek at the new HS Kinds of Middle School, where I was able to convince them to 
uh, take out all the fill from the old playing fields and create a larger flood bench. So now we have this big open area. Hopefully that's going to be used by the community. And they'll say, hey, look at this is actually valuable ecosystem that's doing its job. Maybe we can copy this somewhere else. Awesome. Thank you very much, Daryl. It's, it's a neat project. Um, okay, so we've got a few more questions and our time is running short. So I, I have a quick one for you, Carrie, because I think it's a pretty quick one. Um, it was about the, um, I'm trying to find it here. What about the oxbows in Penticton? Are they connected to the channel? Uh, many of them are connected to the channel. It's a bit of a two sad stories. One sad story is two of the main ones that are connected to the channel um, are also used as overflow from street uh, uh, overflow pipes. So they go into these oxbows and they settle out there. Uh, the water settles out there before it sort of flows back um, into the river. So the, that they're kind of cesspools of a lot of stuff that we've thrown down them. Uh, unfortunately, the other bad news story about the oxbows in Penticton is that the what the Penticton the the river in Penticton used to look like two kilometers of wetlands, and then uh, six kilometers of pools and riffles and meandering, and then two kilometers of wetlands at the bottom at Skaha Lake. Um, and so, if you can imagine wetland and wetland with six kilometers of awesome in between, um, uh, when you put a dam there, we went. Eh. So, and this one came up. And so we've actually backwatered um, a lot of, uh, of that area. So the river that went from uh, over eight kilometers worth of river is now exactly six kilometers from tip to tail. Uh, and only about a kilometer of that actually functions as a river. The rest of it functions more as a backwatering, uh, is imp impacted back from backwatering of uh, Skaha Lake, which inundates those oxbows, which means that they, they don't really function as flowing river areas so much anymore. And then um, being so urbanized uh, and uh, disconnected and slow moving, it, they, they grow a lot of invasive macrophytes, which actually host a lot of um, invasive fish species like the carp um, and the largemouth bass and the yellow perch. Um, that don't normally belong here, but do very, very well in habitats like that. So they're always uh, of interest to kind of keep an eye on how we can kind of make those better places. Um, but uh, that they are almost all of them are connected in one place or another back to the river, though. Some Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Um, Trevor Butler, you have a couple of questions here, and I'm just going to let you know that no one on this panel, I apologize, is involved with the Mill Creek Corridor Flood Prevention Project. That would be the City of Kelowna, unless Anna, you want to, is there anything I, you can- I was. Okay. I monitored all of the Mill Creek Corridor works. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a quick um, answer regarding an update on latest plans for that Mill Creek Corridor Flood Prevention? Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> it was all about setting back dikes and putting trails, elevated trails, as far back from the creek as possible, so they didn't have to put on more more um, aqua dams and sandbagging. Okay, and Trevor, I think that in terms of um, your much larger question about how to even start such a project, um, I think if you want, you can certainly. Um, get in touch with us and we can put you in touch with uh, maybe Daryl or someone else can uh, can give you some information on um, for that. Um, is, um, is there any talk of ecological restoration work for Bellevue Creek in addition to the creation of the Greenway? Does anyone have any information on that at all? I wasn't even, yeah, interesting. That's my backyard. But that's not my question. Okay. Um, just one more here. Um, and Jen Miles is wondering why the trees are upside down at Aspen Grove. Daryl, do you have an answer? That's art. Art? <laughs> it's art. <laughs> it is it was an attempt to provide some additional habit, wildlife habitat, um, but it's really just more about art in that sense something for the kids to look at and play with and wonder why okay. the trees are upside down. A couple more quick questions. We're running out of time. Um, 
And I'm going to, uh, and, and Alex, uh, maybe you want to answer John's question. Um, how important is it to have ways for the public to enjoy these restorations? Do you want to speak to that at all, Anna? I think it's super important. I think that when people can see the beauty of the natural habitat and can enjoy it, can be out near it, that uh, it really inspires people. It, it wakens people up to that, um, the life of, of the natural world around them. I think in the Okanagan, we're very fortunate to have access to all these beautiful arid mountains and hills to walk around in, but we don't have much access to this riparian areas and wetlands. And I know there's some kind of magic about them, even like Munson Pond, which is like this restored gravel pit. It's just so wonderful. You go out there and there's all this wildlife and birds and things going on and people love it there. I'll turn it over to Alex though. Alex, do you have a last uh, word? Well, it also, uh, some of those beautiful wetland environments all, and as arid uh, places uh, alike, they locate you in this place. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, um, uh, I think that uh, can provide great sense for belonging to the place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's nine o'clock and I don't wanna keep folks. So I, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, hopefully James can take us to our last slide because I just wanted to show you folks something and um, a quick shout out to a couple of folks that are here or at least were earlier. Um, Kelly and Karen, who are with the Okanagan Basin Water Board, um, helped us with the relaunch of our updated Slow It, Spread It, Sink It. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, folks were aware of that. So. If you are looking for ways to have positive impacts in your own yard, I just wanted to mention that this is now available on the Okanagan Waterwise website. And, um, and so now that's available and you'll find other materials and resources as well on the Waterwise website um, to help you in your efforts to be more waterwise in our valley. So I just wanted to make sure to mention that. And wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you, James, who's been working in the background to ensure a, a smooth running event. So again, thank you everyone for, for joining us this evening and happy Canada Water Week and good night. Yeah, thanks everybody. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Bye. Carrie. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. And thanks, Alex. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. Thank you.